Hi, everyone. I think we can start. So can you hear me now properly if someone writes, if he or she hears me? So I can start properly. Very good. Okay. So <clears throat> let me introduce myself firstly. But first of all, I'm very happy to be uh, with you. Um, it's my first time. It's very a uh, new event for me. And uh, I'm happy with you. I'm happy to be with you. And let me introduce myself firstly. <clears throat> I'm a brand consultant coming from the advertising industry, uh, living in England and uh, Turkey accordingly. I have an office in Beaconsfield, uh, which is closer to London and Istanbul. And my motto is genuine strategies. And I'm going to build <clears throat> today everything on this motto. And I have uh, the, my current accounts uh, are from uh, banking accounts, uh, bank, uh, banking industry, battery industry, uh, actually ready to wear, um, uh, confectionery, and so on. So uh, I'm going to look at the presentation from the brand point of view. And uh, actually, what I am doing is to be with the clients, I mean, to uh, to be with them in their way to the branding, marketing, and uh, reputation uh, management uh, industry. And uh, I'm a very good fan of Pink Floyd, and one of the <coughs> words uh, of David Gilmer affect me a lot, and I made it uh, as a business motto. Uh, he said once, uh, the sum is greater than the parts. So how I take the strategy uh, is with the philosophy of the total uh, uh, way of looking, total uh, sum, actually. So always the sum is greater for me than the parts. So we are going to, uh, I'm going to speak today, actually, uh, with, the, with this philosophy, looking at the things uh, with an overall perspective. So uh, let me go over the today's content. I'm going to mention about actually firstly branding, marketing, and reputation because uh, we have to understand uh, firstly what is branding, what is marketing, and what is reputation because everybody can say things about this and they are right. They, may, they might be right, but I have to explain my point of view uh, from the point of branding, marketing, and reputation. Then uh, will come the future target audience, new marketing environments we're going to talk about, and new marketing strategies. And finally, uh, I'm going to mention about the corporate communication techniques. Not only uh, will I mention about the corporate communication techniques, but also I'm going to concentrate myself in this presentation on reputation management, uh, along with my model called MUST. It's a strategy model uh, for improving genuine strategies. So uh, let me mention about brand, reputation, brand perception, and reputation firstly. Actually, in our life, I do believe that brand marketing and reputation, they are completely different things but they create the business management uh, finally. And looking at the things, looking at business management, uh, it actually it has three uh, fields. And these are marketing, brand, and reputation. And all, others, all other areas are the suppo uh, supporting management areas. This is my way of looking. So <clears throat> talking about brands, from my point of view, brands, brand is a differentiation with its product and services on the entire stakeholder's mind, not only the consumers, and along with two aspects. One of them is emotional, and the other one is rational. And marketing is completely something else. Marketing is a holistic way of actions. So it's a way of action, which is holistic. And that provides a flow of product and services to the end users. So marketing, from my point of view, in general, is related with mostly the end users. 
not the other stakeholders, to be honest. And there, are, there is another, uh, actually, word called sales. I really, uh, actually, I really don't understand why there is a word called sales, because actually it's a financial action, it's a resultant. So sales is, from my point of view, sales is only a simple financial action between the buyer, a buyer can be B2B or B2C buyer, so between the buyer and the brand. So we have to remember there is another marketing action which is far important than sales, and it's called after sale. So after sale uh, affects much more uh, than the word of sales. So after sales is much more important compared to the word of sales. I'm going to mention about it today's speech. And uh, once, actually maybe it was 20 years ago, I found a caricature. Uh, Sarkis Pacheci is a very famous Turkish uh, caricaturist. And then he made this caricature. Uh, he's saying, actually the teacher is saying, well done, perfect marketing. And it's two plus two makes 3.99. No, this is sales actually. That's got nothing to do with marketing. So <clears throat> we have to understand what is sales. Sales is a resultant and marketing is something else, it's a holistic way of thinking, which is extremely related with branding and reputation management. So let's talk about reputation. Let's understand uh, what is my point of view on it, because it's discussable, of course. Everybody can say different things. And reputation is also a resultant. But this is a kind of resultant that the brand perf performs over the entire stakeholders along with awareness like and all effective criteria in the industry. So actually it's also a resultant, but not related with only the end users, but the entire stakeholders. So actually, finally, we understand that reputation is a resultant. There is an important aspect called stakeholders and awareness like is, an, is a kind of KPIs, key performance uh, indicators, and another key performance indicators are the effective criteria in the industry. So it can be changed uh, from different, uh, from uh, ready to wear industry to banking. So we have to take care of the industry and the industry's effective criteria. So finally, uh, we have to understand, if you, if you talk about new marketing, we have to understand the business management because it's related with the business. If there is a business, there must be a marketing. If there is no business, so there is no brand, no marketing, no uh, reputation management. But the, from my point of view, I always say from my point of view because it can be discussable. So I am working with this philosophy, so this is just my approach. So business management actually stands over marketing, brand, and reputation. These three aspects are uh, critically important and very much related with each other. So all other area, areas, for example, finance, supply management, and etc., are supporting management areas in my business. So <clears throat> let's come to another, uh, let's come to the second uh, actually step of our presentation, it's future target audience. So now we are in a, a paradigm shift uh, epoch, actually. I'm not talking about the mill only millennium, but nowadays, let's say nowadays. Why it's extremely a breakthrough moment? Because there is a different generation. It's called Z generation. Uh, it's completely different than all generations uh, in all times, actually. Z is completely different. We are going to talk about Z today. Uh, actually, in 2002, I made a book uh, called, uh, in Turkish, uh, Z Son Insan, which is Z, is Z, is Z uh, the last man. Uh, thinking about the Fukuyama's, the last man uh, concept, and all marketing, uh, branding, and reputation 
management issues. So that is com I understood that that is completely different than all others came before uh, herself or himself. So let's have a look to the old generation, depending on the U.S. consent, uh, U.S. Uh, excuse me, uh, sources. Actually, there are different generations, like, for example, uh, depression generation in the beginning of the last, uh, last century, then the war generation, baby boomers, X generation, Y generation, millennium generation, and Z generation. Let's have a look all the generations and understand that why Z is completely different than the others coming uh, before herself or himself. So depression generation, just be before the uh, Second World War, imagine that the First World, uh, World War happened and there is a depression actually just because people don't have any work at all. So work and trust uh, are there, uh, are this generation's main insights. Then, come, then comes the Second World War, so it's another uh, shock, and survive, to survive is the only insight of the people. So after the uh, war, I mean, it's a, actually it's a post-war dream, so there are baby boomers. They are extremely happy because two war happened and the next one probably will not come very sooner. And there, uh, there is growth, welfare, product and services, and they began to save. They didn't save any money, anything, before, uh, during the war. And after the war, they, they save money. They see the product and services. They have welfare, and there is growth all around the world. And there is another generation. Actually, this is my generation. It's quite lost generation, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, it's good somehow, but it's, it's, it's also a lost generation. In this generation has different uh, insights, actually. They are idealists. They are social. They become to be social. They are very loyal to everything. They are loyal to their family, their wife, husband, their companies, their societies, everything. So they are loyal people, and uh, they have satisfaction. They are, they are easily, they were easily satisfied. So satisfaction is uh, so easy for them to be satisfied is extremely easy, and of course they. Uh, like savings, they save money, they save materials, they collect things. Then, from my point of view, again, uh, there is another generation. This is actually uh, Y generation, or it's also called next generation. Some of you may remember, Pepsi used this uh, generation's name as a motto of uh, its brand. Pepsi, PepsiCo used this. So. Y generation or next generation is extremely important because in their time uh, there was something which is called PC. The first PC I saw at university was, I don't know how big it was, it was very big and it was extremely slow and we were waiting in the queue to meet this uh, computer to, to work with him because it was male actually and uh, Y generation they have PCs everywhere so they were born with PC and uh, in the end of this generation another thing came this is mobile phone in 1994 so I worked for Turkcell uh, launch in Turkey it was 1994 and maybe it was one year uh, before this uh, launch in Turkey, it uh, also launched in uh, Europe, different, you know, uh, GSM networks. Uh, and then comes Millennium Generation. So Millennium Generation started with PC and mobile. And then in, uh, during the Millennium Generation, everybody met with another thing. It's Internet. So Millennium Generation is individual, technologic, global, conformist, 
they are very spoiled and they are a good spender. Compared with their big brothers and sisters, there is a little difference, actually, very little difference. You see in this slide, uh, it's written technology friendly for Y generation, but it's written technology for millennium generation. So their big brother, Y generation, was very, uh, they, they worked with technology, but they were not technology. So they were technology friendly, but millennium generation was completely technology. And then imagine Z generation. Now, for example, I have a daughter who is a Z generation, and she thinks everything, she thinks everything belongs to herself. And she thinks that she has to work with her iPad every moment. Even you take her iPad from herself, half, half an hour, she goes crazy. Because she, they are actually, they, they depend on this technology. They, they don't work with this technology. They are technology. So they think that this iPad is like their leg or hand. So it's different. So that generation is completely different. Once I was watching TV in 70s, early 70s, uh, my cartoon heroes were uh, these uh, bear, bears. So one of them told, future will not be as in the past Bobo. The small ones named Yogi and Bobo. So Yogi said, future will not be as in the past Bobo. He was right. This is completely different. Future is not going to be like the past. We can, what I'm saying, we can learn very less things from the past, as we used to learn many things from the past, uh, maybe 20 years ago. So now, past is like real past. So let's not forget, there is a big paradigm shift for the moment, and Z is completely different. So, then uh, I definitely recommend a book called A Whole New Mind, written by Daniel Pink. And Daniel Pink says very important things, why Z generation is completely different than the uh, early comers. Because the first one is, humankind is making over speed. Now we are making over speed. We cannot imagine how hard to work in this time of period for an X or Y generation. I cannot imagine a baby boomer, baby boomers feeling in this time of period because we are making over speed. Everything is uh, increasing with a, a logarithm. So it's, uh, it's, it's expand, everything is expanding, everything is Every, everybody is making over speed. Everything is of making over speed. So it's very hard to follow it up. But Z generation is going to follow everything making over speed uh, better than everyone, every generation living in the world for the moment. And uh, to be honest, uh, they don't think they are rich. They think it's normal, but it's the age of wealth because everybody can reach everything of course there are pe poor people in the world but there are poor people but when i went to africa i went to kenya i went to tanzania i went to uganda so i saw people many people wearing nike adidas and it was not somebody else's it was not second hand it was the first hand so it's the age of wealth you can reach anything. Everybody can reach anything in the world. There are many things. There are more things, actually. And that is why people began to love these things. Love and live. Love and live at the same time. I used to love my uh, things. I used to love my sportswear, my first computer, or my first gene. But... I used to leave them not uh, this much quicker. So these people love their things, they have more things, and they live very easily. 
Another uh, aspect for Z generation, which is completely new uh, compared to the old generations, is Asia. Asia uh, was far east for many generations, for my generation, for Y generation, even millennium, even millennium. But after Z, uh, which is actually roughly uh, 2002, three, the Z generation starts that day, uh, those days, Asia is critically important. Critically important for us, but, but quite normal for Z generation. There is an Asia reality. Let's see what is Asia reality in branding. So look at the sixth rate. There is Samsung. Samsung is in the top 10 of in Interbrands 2017 ranking. So it's not the first time Samsung is in top 100 for many years. And it, it's increasing, rising uh, its stars year by year. Now it's the sixth rate, uh, rating. So let's see others, for example, not only Samsung, Kia, for example. Kia is now 69, but it was 80 something two years ago. So it was in top 100, maybe for more than seven years, but increasing day by day. Huawei, it's another technology and GSM company uh, from a Asia. Samsung is from South Korea. Uh, Kia is from South Korea and Huawei is Chinese. So another one is Hyundai. We know Hyundai very well. It's 35. So it's very important. Let me tell you something. I mean, 20 years ago, these ratings only was from, uh, you know, European, of course, uh, Japan, but we cannot call Japan Asiatic uh, country. Japan was American, a, a, actually, North American, European, and Japanese. This area is something else. This is the first leg of the brand. Now there is an Asia reality, and there are four brands from Asia and one from uh, one brand from Mexico. So it's extremely important, and they are increasing their power uh, incredibly. This is Huawei's uh, last year's performance: 14% increase. Now. 6 billion, 6.6, 6, let me say 6.7 roughly, approximately, 6.7 billion dollars brand value. Of course, compared to uh, Apple, it's quite small, but uh, the brands from Asia are increasing. Uh, for example, look, look at, um, excuse me, Look at Apple, for example. Apple increased 3%, but Huawei increased here uh, 14%. It's, it's very important. Samsung, 9%, 6% uh, Kia, and 5% uh, Hyundai, quite a lot. And there is another reality is automation. So automation is going to affect branding, marketing, and reputation management. Automation is a reality because things are much more automated um, in, the, in today's world. Uh, I lived in UK uh, in 1988 and 90, between 1988 and 90, uh, 91, roughly three years. And in those days, I managed everything uh, face to face, and uh, I moved my family uh, to United Kingdom in the beginning of this year, and everything was automated. I really wonder what the elderly people are doing. Uh, how can they deal with this? So automation is important. And Kasparov once said in 1987, "No computer can beat me." And after 10 years, Deep Blue with a weight of 1.54 tons, brought to ruin himself. Beat it. Incredible. And uh, this is the world of the Z generation. So 
what sort of environment we have uh, thinking about new marketing. I'm going to approach this session uh, in three perspectives. One of them is new marketing environment along with the industries. The other one is companies and stakeholders. Let's see what, what do I mean by the industries. When I started uh, advertising industry in the beginning of the uh, 90s, actually retail, beverages, financial services, automotive was the main industries. Actually, retail was the first one. Beverages uh, can be considered underneath the retail, but uh, second one. And then comes financial services, banking industry, insurance, uh, etc., and of course, automotive. Now it's technology. If you look at uh, interbrand or brand finance uh, top 100, top 500 uh, brand rankings, you're going to see many technology brands. Actually, they are uh, incre they increase their brand value much more than the others uh, increase. So top five sectors, now it's technology. Technology is in the front line. And then companies, let's have a look the new marketing environment along with the companies. In terms of companies, actually once I read a very critical uh, uh, wording uh, belonging to a CEO, actually it's General Electric, uh, the CEO of General Electric, Jeffrey R. Immel. It was in 19, uh, it was in 2009 and he said, General Electric respects its usual competitors like Siemens, Philips, and Rolls-Royce. GE knows how to compete with them. They cannot destroy General Electric. However, the emerging market multinationals may do this. So that is why I say, be scared of them. Very scared, very much scared. Actually, uh, actually in before 2000, if someone would have asked me, what do you think about that your children uh, should work uh, in these companies? I would say, for example, I would say Turkcell, Procter & Gamble, Unilever, or the big me uh, medicine company, pharmaceutical companies. But now there are others. Actually, Jeffrey Immelt is mentioning about the others. We were calling them the others uh, 20 years ago. Now, Jeffrey Immelt and uh, some intelligent, smart CEOs calls them emerging market multinationals. Who are they? Actually, they are coming mostly from these countries. Turkey is one of them. But for the big ones is, for example, South Korea and China. Also, Thailand, India, Indonesia, Russia. Uh, I said Asia, but also Mexico and Brazil. There are different companies now, different uh, carriers. For example, now I said Samsung, Hyundai, Kia, Huawei, but also Lenovo, for example. IBM was my hero 30 years ago, 40 years ago. When I was in, for example, high school, I was saying, okay, something how big IBM is. I was thinking about IBM. I was thinking about Coca-Cola. But now people are thinking about Lenovo, Archelic, Tata. Tata is a great company. They are dealing with automotive industry, tea industry, watching, watch uh, industry, many industries. HTC, Mahindra, Natura, for example. It's a Brazilian a company, Brazilian cosmetic company, and do you know that Natura is competing with French brands in France, Titan, uh, Hong Kong, so many different, many uh, uh, new emerging countries, multinationals are coming. And stakeholders, we have to, we also have to look at the stakeholders uh, for the perspective of new marketing environment. One, the first stakeholder is end users. 
it's critically important. And three, I would like to give you three critical uh, insights uh, in terms of end users. They are more spoiled than ever. So they don't like anything. So don't trust traditional uh, CRM. And they have a complexity of paradox of choice. Imagine that there are many brands in the sales point. So how can you decide one of them? And this uh, trend, the paradox of choice, is actually uh, critically affecting the end user's decision. So it's better to be simple. For example, in Turkey, in England as well, I can give you uh, both countries' insights and uh, actually uh, observations, my observations. Uh, some retail points are acting to be very simple. They have, for example, just 600 SKUs, stock keeping units. Simply, they don't have too much products. They have each category, they have all categories, but you can go them and maybe in each category you see ju just three brands. They select, uh, of course, it's a reachable um, brand. For example, BIM, it's called BIM in Turkey, uh, is acting like this. Only 600 SKUs. Everybody thinks that their motto is, their marketing understanding, actually, sorry about this, uh, I said motto, marketing understanding, uh, but their marketing understanding is not to be the cheapest one. And to be honest, they are not the cheapest one. They are cheap, they are reachable, but not the cheapest one. But the actually differentiation point is not the price sensitivity, is the uh, SKU understanding, paradox of choice. So they just have 600 SKUs. Imagine 600 product units. Uh, unit keeping point. So it's actually their differentiating point because people uh, have complexity of paradox or choice. They don't want to see too many brands. They, so they, they want to be simple. And end user is extremely hedonist than ever. So the brands, companies must be enjoyable. So brand has to be enjoyable and the brand's marketing has to be enjoyable because they are hedonist. Hedonist people think they will not die. So it's important. They want to live the moment as much as possible, deeply. So this is the today's end users' uh, insights. Media, media is also very complex. Uh, <clears throat> media is very much fragmented. So we have to be very much precise in media mix. We have to think about it in every campaign. We, we cannot actually uh, media. We cannot create a media mix strategy for for a you know physical year. So we have to think about the media mix in every uh, campaign uh, again and again, starting from zero. Uh, for example, today in a meeting uh, we talk about this. Uh, one of my clients' uh, brand made a campaign in the beginning of launch in the beginning of the, this year, and it was very successful. And uh, this brand has uh, would like to this brand would like to repeat it again, but after eight months, nearly eight months. So uh, they tried uh, actually they tried to, to they tried to use the same media mix because it's already done successful. And they say, okay, it's okay. So we can use this media mix again. And I said, no, we don't know. We don't know the new conditions. Everything is changing. There are many paradigm shifts in Turkey, politically, socially, and it affects media. So we have to rethink again. We have to be precise in today's media mix. What is the best one for us? So we cannot have a template for this. And we also have to differentiate ourselves among many events and press built-in. So <clears throat> PR cannot be made with only press built-in and we cannot expect uh, always 
strong KPIs after every campaign. So we have to concentrate ourselves and we have to make good relations with the media and uh, we have to actually concentrate uh, strong events. Not always, we cannot expect uh, success from every event we made uh, throughout the year. And we have to, we can use the local media effect efficiently and effectively. Local media is disregarded, unfortunately. It's still disregarded, but local media is extremely important, even uh, in internet. I don't mean just uh, traditional ones. And social media, uh, firstly, we have to be native. To be native in uh, social media is extremely important. So we cannot create a social media strategy and apply it through the social media platforms, okay? This is Facebook, this is Twitter, Instagram. Uh, no, we can't. So we have to think separately for Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Or if we cannot create it, create something native for, uh, for a, a social media pl platform. So we have to take it out from our social media uh, mix. And we definitely have to make risk assessment. Unfortunately, uh, for example, when I look at the uh, projects in England and Turkey, they make risk assessment there. We don't like risk, uh, to make risk assessment because um, I think we love, we love uh, uh, the destiny and that is why we don't like risks. But we have to make risk assessment for social media because it's extremely risky and will be much more risky day by day. It's very easy. We can uh, determine the risks and the possibility. Let's imagine that you put possibilities in the x-axis, uh, these risks and possibilities to, re to be realized, and the impact. So it's very easy. The most easiest thing, maybe the most easiest things, thing in the world uh, to determine the risks and to understand how, what is the impact, what is the possibility, low, medium, high, it's easy to think about this, and the impact when it comes through. So we can understand what, how we are going to act, what is the biggest risks, uh, and so on. Uh, in Turkey, in these five years, uh, the, in the last five years, honestly, from my point of view, my jobs, uh, in my job, uh, it was very hard to manage the manage the social media because it's it's risky. People talk about it and it's spread over everywhere. And what we can do, it's simple for my for me. I always advise this to have patience to manage social media. Sometimes to be in silence. Sometimes to manage personally, one by one. Sometimes with other uh, reputation management techniques, but we have to be patient and very clever, very smart uh, to use the wording. It's, it's critically important because people, especially in East part of the world, uh, including Turkey, people wait you to make a mistake. This is very critical. And social media is the place where you can show your ego and your brand's ego, but sometimes it's exploded. It's extremely important to think about what social media platform you're going to use, and it's, it's better to be modest here, because it's the riskiest platform uh, than ever. And tra talking about trade and sales point, uh, it's very crowded. Now, uh, in the new marketing, uh, epoch, it's extremely crowded. So it's it's better to find good ways to be seen in this crowd. And to reflect identity design perfectly. And there is a tool for this, actually. It's an asset, shopper marketing. And uh, it's I don't mean below the line. I don't like the word of below the line, above the line in uh, advertising or below the line in the adver uh, advertising. I don't like the word of 
below the line because it's disregarded. The, the world of below uh, cannot have the right value. So it's shopper marketing. You have to go to the uh, sales point and you have to think how the consumer is walking, where they are looking at, how do they act, what do they do, how many people are shopping together. It's the most beautiful thing, actually. It's, it's a good experience. So you have to make observations and then you have to decide what can I do in the sales point. Advertising doesn't help you. Advertising, I'm an ad man, old ad man. Uh, actually, believe me, you make advertising and somebody else's wins with your uh, advertising. So sales point is extremely important. Please do use shopper marketing techniques and make perfect experiential marketing events. I don't mean to make parties here. Sometimes a small place to meet with the uh, consumer, but not with a you know a salesman activity. It's a brand manager activity, a brand manager activity. Share the experience if you have. If you don't have an experience with your brand, or in other words, your brand cannot create experience, uh, you have to rethink again. It has to. So experiential marketing in the sales point is so important. Shareholders, <clears throat> we used to have shareholders in old times uh, having the same company for ages. But now it changes very often with merger and acquisition operations. So the boss always changes to different bosses. And they have more stress day by day. So it's critically important to manage the shareholders. Of course, it's not the brand manager's um, duty. It's the director's duty, but thinking about that everybody becomes a director one day, uh, responsible of branding, marketing, and reputation um, operations. So you have to manage shareholders. If you don't manage shareholders, you cannot uh, make any operations because shareholders are now much more uh, with their business uh, than before and employees. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit more about uh, empl on employees because uh, one Starbucks uh, brand uh, strategist said, our brand value is the sum of our employees' performance. It's critically important. He was, it's Michael, uh, I forgot the surname, When I, if I remember, I will uh, uh, repeat, and the, uh, these strategies, Starbucks strategies, said that, uh, saying that em employees' performance is the source of the brand value. So if all employees work prop properly, precisely, the brand value increases. This is true. This is very true because Starbucks is very successful in this area. If you uh, read the book of Michael Michelli, actually, now I remember, Dr. Michael Michelli said uh, this, and if you read his book, the, the book's name is Starbucks, this, The Starbucks Experience, you're going to see that all employees create the whole, whole brand value. But unfortunately, there are very less loyal employees anymore. It's the biggest risk of the brands. You cannot create a brand without the loyal employees. There are, uh, now there are less drivers. Drivers are extremely important because they have high motivation and high loyalty. But unfortunately now there are happy sleepers and detached employee, employees. What, who are happy sleepers? You are going to see them uh, in your work everywhere. They are everywhere. Actually, uh, they have loyalty, but they don't have motivations. They are called residents as well. If they give work, they work. If don't, if you don't, they just stay. They sit, they sleep. They are extremely happy. 
So they are loyal. They work in this country, in this company, maybe 20 years, but they don't have motivation, self or motivation, self motivations. They don't have. And detached ones, they are completely different. Uh, detached are, they don't have loyalty, but they have motivations. So they are going to go to somewhere else, definitely. So very less drivers and more happy sleepers and detached employees. You cannot make, you cannot create a good brand value with these kind of uh, employee uh, structure. So what should we do? We have to own great directors who can manage the employee's heart. Actually, uh, how can we have great directors? So we have to have them because they are very good. They, they, they cannot manage, they can manage uh, emotions. How can we get them? So whenever we see them, they are drivers, we have to actually keep them and then we have to educate them to be a good directors who will heart who who will win the employee's heart and uh, once one of my uh, consultants when i was work, working in the agency one of our consultants said people don't leave the companies people leave the leave their directors or the other way around people don't work in the companies people work with the good directors. It's extremely important. Good directors create good people. Good people create good brands. And that is why uh, I created a, a strategy model for employee branding. I called it FAST. So FAST is saying you have to give freedom to, the, to your uh, employees. And these employees have to create autonomy and you have, they have to create, after freedom and autonomy, they have to cre definitely create a simplicity uh, all around the company using, with, using the technology. So that's why I call it fast. And uh, not only I am doing, not only do I do a brand consultancy, I understood that I should also do uh, employee uh, consultancy, even if I'm not uh, experience in this uh, area. I am working with good IT people, and if we cannot be fast, we cannot be. We cannot create anything. Even if we have very good agency, very good uh, brand people, it doesn't matter. If the company doesn't give freedom to the people, if they don't, if the people don't uh, create their autonomy in the company, yes, autonomy, definitely. They are small areas, but they are areas. And if the company think, don't think uh, in with, don't think with simplicity and do not use technology, it doesn't matter. Even if you write the best brand strategy, it will not work. The other way around, it will work. So this, the, uh, when it works, I call it genuine strategy. So genuine strategy is the uh, actually new marketing strategies. So talking about new marketing strategies, I'm going to go over some critical points. Uh, one of them is actually, I mentioned about this hedonism. <clears throat> we have to be vivid. We have to uh, love life because people love life more than ever. They are very much hedonists. That is why they love music, they love gaming, they don't like saving, they like spending. They want to uh, get benefits of this world too much because they really don't think they will die. This generation, that generation thinks that they will live forever and then they want to get everything. So the marketing has to be hedonist as well. And now is in, we, what we, we have to think about the, the now. Now is that extremely important. So, for example, we made a, a training session with one of my clients and we said, what is the now? This is very important. I'm not talking about now. I'm, not, I'm talking about the now. So we have to think about the moment. Whenever, whatever we uh, do, it's about now. We cannot take it 
as an intellectual intel, uh, intellectual uh, capital, and we can use it forever, or we can we can use it uh, the whole year. Um, Ten years ago, we were making marketing plans, and we we were finding strategies for each year, and we were saying that okay, we are going to use this strategy for this year. Then this year, we are going to change this and add this. No, everything is working with Navism. So we have to think about our marketing strategy, which is actually, if it fits to now or not, Navism is extremely important. And new media is screens. Uh, new media is screens. There are screens. Z generation, they are 11 years old, 10 years old, uh, 14 years old, 15 years old. After five years old, they are going to be at, in, in university. So we have to think about them. New media, screens. They just see screens. They don't have television. They, don't, they are not going to call the, this stuff, which is actually on the wall, uh, with the word of television. It's a screen on the wall. It's a screen in their hand. It's a screen on the table. Or sometimes, or one day, it's a screen that, uh, on hand. So it's screen. New media is screen. And uh, feelings and humor is critically important in the uh, new marketing strategies. So uh, I call it the rise of right brain. Right, we have to use our right brain. I don't mean that left brain is dead. No, this is going to be used in other uh, industries. Marketing, no, it's, impo it's impossible. It's the rise of the right brain. And right brain says feelings and humor is important. For example, this t-shirt is saying, um, don't never uh, underestimate a woman who listens to Pink Floyd and was born in July. This affected me too, too much because I love Pink Floyd. And this is not the only T-shirt in the world. There are many T-shirts, cupboards, cups, pen, jeans, talking with the people. Imagine that products are talking with the people, with feelings and humor. That is why we need the rise of the right brain. And the new customer, they are prosumers. Believe me, one day, customers will write the brand's uh, ad. We are going to see it. A brand will say that, will, will ask all the customers, uh, what about to write our new campaigns ad? And somebody will write a great copy. I'm sure he or she will be. So prosumers, so they produce actually, they produce their own brands or they produce their own product for their brands. And there is a very new habit, which is extremely important, connectivity. If people don't want to uh, lose their connectivity with their friends, with their family, with, their, uh, with the people in their parish, or uh, with, someone who, uh, with someone who they know uh, from the social media, they want to, to they want to be connected. So a brand cannot a brand doesn't have a luxury of losing uh, its connectivity. The last part of this presentation, uh, actually, yes, everything is uh, the brand is important. Brand value is important. So marketing helps branding, and we know that our target audience is Z generation. And we know that generation's expectations and the new marketing strategies, yes, of course, it's discussable. This is, these are my ideas. But the headlines are the same, so you can listen to uh, some other people. You can listen yourself and decide about this, uh, actually, sequence. But there is something extremely important, which is reputation. So reputation is also related with perception management. So we can call reputation and perception management. From my point of view, today's, if we talk about today's communication techniques, 
we have to learn how can we uh, create a strong reputation management, of course, along with perception. So uh, I'm going to talk about a model, which this is my model, because I write reputation strategies for my clients as well. Because if you don't manage your reputation, even if your brand is great or your marketing is great, it doesn't help. Reputation takes all your energy one day or the other way around positively. If your reputation works properly with branding and marketing, that's so that's that's good. That is uh, something we really expected. So I use this model and this model is called must. So must must start with market attractiveness. Also, I mean, not only uh, am I uh, explaining the perception and reputation strategy, but I am also explaining now the strategy sequence. So you can take it uh, in general as well along with the strategy. So the first step is market attractiveness. So what is market attractiveness? It's actually simple. First step, which we analyze the current situation. Situation. We have to analyze our current situation to write a good perception and reputation management. So, what is market attractiveness? Actually, is the first market attractiveness is the first phase of strategy writing, which is actually, firstly, you analyze the market environment and climate then you figure out the perception level of stakeholders. This is very critical. And then you appoint, and my cat came finally, <laughs> you appoint a clear vision and you define the barriers and opportunities in front of this vision. So firstly, determine the stakeholders. Who are your stakeholders? It's very critical. You have to determine your your all stakeholders and then you analyze the paradigms and trends because paradigms and trends affect your stakeholders then you understand their need their expectations habits behaviors and insights of all your stakeholders and you figure out the perception level of stakeholders in each of, in each component so think about your stakeholders, you go to them, you understand their needs, expectations, habits, behaviors, and insights. And then finally, you create a perception level. It will show you a level. And then after this level, now you can appoint a strategic vision. And then when you appoint a vision, after looking at your uh, current position, you are going to see the barriers and opportunities in front of the vision. Then comes unlock growth part. So it's the part uh, where you write strategy. So this is the second part of the uh, must strategy model. And then in this step, you establish the whole framework. What is the framework? You figure out a strategic path. Today, I'm going to give you a case study. I'm going to actually uh, talk about the case study, and you are going to see what is strategic part, st strategic part in this case study. But you have to figure out a big part, part, and then you figure out the meaning and messages for the brand because you are going to give these messages to the whole stakeholders and then define the success areas. What is a strategic part? Let me explain uh, this wording. It's actually the way that breaks through the front line of the battlefield. Actually, it's a military word, but how can we translate this into the branding, marketing, and reputation management uh, like this? You're going to find one line, one big line. It's a concept, actually, brand concept. And this brand concept is going to break through the front line of the battlefield, your competitors. So what are the success areas? It's important. This is a strategy model I use. The success areas 
are the certain areas uh, that takes you to the vision, that takes you to up. For example, some, I'm going to, uh, I, let me give you some uh, examples. Ar architecture of brand identity is a success area. So the strategist understood that architect, he or she has to create an architecture for brand identity. So if he or she can't, he or she can't uh, go up to the vision. Or improvement point of sale and network. It's another area, for example. These are just examples. Or establishment of employee brand, operational excellence, reinforcement of marketing and marcom capabilities, or accountability. I'm going to give you an example and uh, it will appear in your mind much more clearly. So solution generation, when you find uh, your success areas, imagine that you're going to, these are what to do's and you have to write how to do's underneath of each area. For example, what, uh, how should I do uh, to make a great architecture of brand identity or improvement uh, point of sale and network? So what to do's and how to do's. Actually, solution generation is related with the world of how to do's. So how can we create a strategy-driven solution? This is the main question for solution generation. So thinking about, again, for reputation management, you define the ideas and solutions for each strategic imperatives or the other word, success areas. Imagine that you have six bucks. These are your success areas. You have to define, firstly, a good strategist, define the success areas earlier than the ideas. So you have to put your ideas into the related box. Otherwise, it's a complexity. When you do it perfectly, you figure out a strong planning that takes you to the vision. And tracking, of course, it must be accountable. Accountability is important. Uh, tracking, is, tracking KPIs is the last step that we determine all KPIs to be used in balanced scorecard. So it's the uh, time of measure measurement. So tracking KPIs along with the reputation management, you measure the key performance indicators for each strategic imperatives. I'm going to give you examples. And then you evaluate the impact of reputation and perception management plan, then you ref redefine the new uh, objectives. You uh, measure the impacts and according to the impacts, you redefine the new objectives or you go on with the um, old one. So finally, uh, I, I, I request you two more minutes. Uh, my case study is about Turkish Airlines. So Turkish Airlines case study uh, my actually, I worked for Turkish Airlines uh, between 2006 and uh, 2009. And I wrote Turkish Airlines uh, branding and marketing strategy and reputation management strategy with my strategy department. And this is the picture of uh, the starting point. Uh, actually, in X axis uh, is the airline traffic and y-axis is the uh, reputation and perception and look at Turkish Airlines actually it's called the brand's health it's this part is called brand's health and Turkish Airlines was in a very bad position and the vision was to go the first uh, part or the top right part where Emirates, British Airways, Lufthansa, Singapore, Katai are. So we had to write a strategical uh, part, a great part that takes you to the vision. And of course, we had to op uh, actually determine the strategic imperatives. So you see now the Turkish Airlines uh, overall strategy written in 
2006 and still valid for. In 2006, the management decided to be one of the top flighter global brand. Was Turkish Airlines a global brand? No, it was not a global brand. It was not a global network, actually, airline network. It was a national flag carrier. I mean, what is national flag carrier? National flag carrier takes you to abroad and takes someone from, uh, takes people uh, from abroad to your country. So it's not a global network. For example, an Englishman, when he, or an Englishman, when he uh, um, thinks to come to Turkey, thinks first the British Airways, then Turkish Airlines, if necessary. If not, he flies with uh, British Air Airlines. So we made a research all around the world and understood the big barrier. Turkish Airlines is not a top flighter global brand. It's a three star uh, out of five, three star national flag carrier. So we wrote a new uh, strategical path. Actually, I'm proud of this because I write, uh, I wrote this uh, strategy called Feel Like a Star. So Feel Like a Star actually depended on Turkish cuisine and Turkish hospitality. So how did we come to this point? We, when we read, uh, when we read the researches, actually we were very disappointed because uh, Skytrax researches showed that all around the world, uh, we Turkish Airlines were three star, three stars airlines in every uh, element of the um, research. Out of 100 elements, Turkish Airlines, actually maybe 96 of them, Turkish Airlines were 2.5 stars or 3 stars. But we found out that Turkish Airlines has 5 stars in 4 or 5, I don't remember properly right now, 4 or 5 elements. They were actually related with Turkish cuisine and Turkish hospitality. Many people from abroad, the foreign uh, travelers, used to give five stars to the meal they ate in the uh, aircraft and the portion of the meal. And also the hospitality of the uh, cabin crew. So that is why we said it was an aha moment. Okay, we, fought, I, we said, okay, the strategy team, okay, we found something. Because Turkish Airlines actually feel make you feel like a star. So this was our strategical path, and we wrote this uh, strategical path just underneath of the vision, and we found out the success areas. We said we have to rebuild the architecture of brand identity. We have to create a big growth in international flights because Turkish Airlines wants to be top flyer and wants to be a global network, global brand. And the third one was, it's not enough. Turkish Airlines has to be very good in beyond flights, which is actually, you know, you make a stopover somewhere and you, you fly somewhere else. Beyond is extremely important. And of course, operational excellence. This cannot be uh, related with advertising and branding strategies. It's also related with operations. So operation has to support it. So you really have to show your cuisine uh, with the best performance. You really have to show your hospitality with the best performance. And also, of course, after an operational ex excellence, you have to reinforce your marketing and marcom uh, capabilities. And you also have to make uh, your employee proud of this new strategical path, which is feel like a star. So finally, actually, I request you to enter uh, this uh, link and then uh, watch the first television uh, commercial of Turkish Airlines in 2009.
Okay, I'm putting the link now. Just a moment. Yeah, I did it. Did you see it? Did everyone watch it? Okay, I think I think you watched. It. All right. Okay, great. So uh, Turkish Airlines actually made this TV commercial with Kevin Costner, and Kevin Costner uh, explained that. Everybody can feel uh, like a star in Turkish Airlines. So it's not only for the stars, real stars. It's for everyone. And Turkish Airlines actually do it very well, to be honest. And Turkish Airlines is the... Now, actually, Turkish Airlines is selected, is being selected every year, the best airline of Europe. So it was the first step. Of course, the strategy was for... Uh, 10 years. So in these 10 years, Turkish Airlines uh, actually realized some of the some of the major KPIs. For example, the destinations. Turkish Airlines has the more destinations uh, than all other uh, networks, global networks. So this is one KPI. And now Turkish Airlines is a global network. And of course. Uh, afterwards, uh, they made sponsorship with Manchester United, Barcelona, and different uh, companies all around the world, actually. Even if Afri in Africa, in Asia, uh, you, may, we, you may not see uh, everything, but Turkish Airlines is following the same strategy. Makes you feel like a star. The, this is not a motto. This is not a slogan. This is not an advertising idea. This is a brand idea. So the brand idea is the most critical strategical path that makes a grand branding, a great branding, a great marketing, and a great reputation management. So it's an enabler, actually. This is very critical, my friends. So if you have a brand idea, a strategical path where uh, you find it, in the unlock growth part, the strategy part. So now you can make, uh, you can create many things around it. So uh, one, so one agency can come and cannot come and change everything. So you say that my brand idea is makes you feel like a star. This is actually a big insight of the target audience. And I'm doing it perfectly. I, this is my marketing ability. This is my operation ability. So everything comes around. Manchester, remember Manchester United TV commercial. It was completely different. It was a sponsorship. But the main idea underneath was the same with Kevin Costner campaign or uh, Barcelona or, and the others. So uh, I repeat the word again. I am finishing it. Uh, the strategical part is the brand idea, and the brand idea takes you to great branding, great marketing, and great reputation management. So I thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have questions, I have plenty of time. I don't know yours, but I have plenty of time, and I can answer your uh, questions. I'm here. Thank you very much indeed. I'm happy you liked it.
Uh, there is a question. I think what do uh, what what to do if you cannot get Kevin Costner? <laughs> uh, th there are many solutions. I mean, you we don't have to uh, use celebrities always. The idea is actually feel like a star. So if we wouldn't have a chance to use Kevin Costner, uh, we would definitely use or find another idea but it has to this is creativity an agency uh, had to do this so we were lucky uh, that we found mr costner because he was a real gentleman honestly and uh, we worked very he was an easygoing person surprisingly uh, i worked with many celebrities turkish celebrities as well um, he was so easygoing we were lucky but if we wouldn't have found himself, we would definitely do something else, which explains again the you know feel like a star strategy. Oh, I hope one day my book is uh, will be translated into English. That is right. Okay, uh, Ayhan Demir says that uh, inside management systems are very traditional. You are definitely right, but believe me, uh, I'm flying a lot. Believe me, for example, British Airways are the same because you, you, I definitely would go along with you there, Ayhan. Uh, actually, it's because airline industry, all airline industry, all airline companies uh, in every country are coming from government industry so they started as a government uh, governmental corporations and then the uh, privatization actually made them a private brand so their systems are definitely traditions you're right but uh, what is important i mean turkish airlines are lucky because uh, turkish cuisine and turkish um, hospitality uh, was the differentiating point and that was not related with the system actually the whole system it's only you know cabin uh, in-flight uh, uh, management uh, issues actually so it was easy to do it if you have this cap capability of course Uh, no, we didn't uh, prepare the advertising campaign uh, starring Bat Batman. Uh, it was the one of the last ones, actually. Uh, I worked for Turkish Airlines between 2006 and 2009, establishing the uh, not only the advertising campaign, the overall strategy. My, my business is brand strategy, marketing strategy, and reputation strategy I wrote this of course 2009 2009 was the year I started uh, uh, my own business brand consultancy business so I worked for Turkish Airlines when I was a, a agency a chief strategist so I had, a, I had a strategy department in the agency and we wrote Turkish Air, for Turkish Airlines feel like a start strategy Afterwards, after 2009, I didn't work uh, in any agency. I just worked um, as a uh, brand strategist in my own company. I thank you all, definitely. Thank you very much indeed to, uh, for listening to me. Yeah, their new motto is widen your world. Actually, feel like a star and motto is not, uh, you, you, we cannot put them uh, into the same uh, pot. Uh, motto is different. Do we need a motto? I, I'm not sure about this. I mean, a motto or a brand name or a logo cannot uh, save ourselves. What is, uh, what can, what is our saver uh, or savers are, uh, are actually branding marketing and reputation management capabilities. So 
the first the first one was actually after after uh, after me after I left uh, working with work, working for Turkish Airlines they wrote globally yours or uh, and then widen your work that doesn't that's not that's got nothing to do with the you know uh, strategical part it's just advertising uh, copyright uh, copyright advertisers copywriting the idea is feel like a star and Turkish cuisine and Turkish hospitality it's still going on to be honest you answer <laughs> okay thank you very much indeed but uh, one of our friends says, to be honest, the brand strategy with Kevin Costner was much better than the one with Batman. Thank you very much indeed. I also like Batman, but of course, Kevin Costner had, uh, Kevin Costner campaign uh, is critically important for myself, for my ca career as well. It was a good start, honestly. But really, we were very lucky that we worked with uh, Mr. Costner because the celebrity's uh, attitude and heart is also critical uh, in a campaign. Yeah, Batman targets Y and Z generation. Ihan is definitely right. Uh, I definitely would go along with Ihan in this point because uh, it was their luck that in this time, in that time, there was Batman. And of course, there was Batman's film. So it, when we used Kevin Costner, we didn't have any uh, opportunity to to use like uh, you know Kevin Costner's uh, film or something else. But Batman, Batman was a was also a good uh, action, good idea. Uh, definitely fits with the target audience uh, expectations. Governmental. Uh, I, I can talk about Turkey. Uh, I cannot talk about the other countries because I didn't work any governmental institutions in abroad. Uh, it's very hard to make reputation management in Turkey in governmental uh, institutions. I'm sorry to say this, but nothing related with the uh, today's uh, power. Uh, today's uh, actually. Uh, politics uh, in all times I mean I can talk about the governmental institutions uh, for 40 years for example I'm 54 years old and I can 